Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today's Saturday, February 2nd, 2019. And I uh, wanted to start things off uh, talking about some recent news. Uh, title of today's video is Oil is Up 18% in January. Um, that's the largest increase on record in one month for the price of oil. But before we get into the oil news and my thoughts on oil, and oil prices and oil stocks. I want to go over some uh, recent news in the resource markets, kind of a potpourri, if you will. Um, I got an email the other day from someone that was curious about uh, an article that had been written on a anti-nuclear site by an, uh, some kind of uh, environmentalist or something like that. But one of the points that was being made in the article was that you know, nuclear is dying, uh, it's going away, the Chinese suspended their nuclear program. That's not exactly true. What actually has happened or did happen was the Chinese were looking at various types of reactor designs and they finally settled on one. So there was a hiatus uh, in beginning new construction. There was continuing construction of already approved uh, plants but there was a hiatus on um, announcing and starting new plants. So they finally got through this process of um, selecting a design, and the news came out last week that they are moving forward with uh, construction of new, four new plants uh, under this new design. So that's what we expected. And, you know, just to kind of put the final nail in the coffin on this whole nuclear power is dying uh, agenda, the reason that the Chinese are building nuclear plants is because they are choking on auto and coal-fired generation particulate matter, literally. So I'm going to post a video that was a TED Talk given by a professor of physics that talks about kind of what I've been talking about in the past, and he has some good visuals in his presentation. I'll, I'll put in a link to it. But basically what he talks about is the amount of watts that can be produced by various power production technologies per square meter. And when he's talking about solar and wind, you're talking like a half a watt or 2.5 watts per square meter, which isn't a lot. That's why you need so much space. And uh, in his lecture, he talks about if you wanted to, to produce enough energy for the UK, which is where he's given the talk, you would have to blanket like 25% of the country with windmills and solar farms, and that's not going to happen. So if you look at nuclear, you're at a, like, you know, the small little area to put a plant, it's like 1,000 watts per square meter. So that's why we use nuclear power. It's not because that's why we use oil. That's why we use natural gas. It's not because we're fat, greedy people that want to kill your children. It's because in a modern, industrial, technologically, uh, society that requires 99.9% um, on-demand electricity. These are the most dense power sources and reliable power sources. And energy density matters. That's why we use these types of fuels. So I'll put a link to that. Um, the Chinese are moving forward. The Indians are moving forward. People in the Middle East are moving forward with nuclear. It's going to continue. It's a growth industry. You know, the ridiculousness of the West, I mean, just for an example, the energy transition, I can't pronounce it in German, it was like energy weed, weed or something like that, it means energy transition, where the Germans have spent a trillion dollars trying to transition to a low carbon uh, power source, i.e. renewables. Like uh, putting solar panels in northern Germany is a really good idea when it's only six hours of sunlight in the wintertime. So what has ended up happening after a trillion dollars of spending is that you have doubled power costs for electricity and you're burning more lignite coal than you've ever burned before. So, you know, we see these announcements by politicians. I don't, don't listen to politicians. They're sociopaths. They have an agenda. That's to get reelected. They say and do whatever they think is the correct thing to do. Um, it's the same thing like in France and Spain. They both announced they're going to get rid of their nuclear fleets, but oh, it's being postponed into the indefinite future. I'm not going to get rid of them, okay? There's nothing, there's nothing to replace them. That's the whole basis of this 
yellow vest thing. You know, they tried to raise taxes on fuel, motor fuel in France, and you, they've been having protests for four months straight. So um, people are not really up for this stuff. The elites are, but uh, everybody else, regular, low class, middle class, working people, don't want their power costs and their fuel costs doubled and tripled to lower CO2 emissions. It's just that simple. Um, people in the east, where power is shifting to China and India and Southeast Asia, these are rational people that are going to use nuclear power. So no need to continue to ask me about this. It's not going away. It's going to grow. Um, that kind of segues into the next point, which was the TED Talk that I will give a link to. It's uh, Dr. David McKay. He actually talks about the math around these things, like I've talked about in the past, but he actually puts good data to it. So the other thing I wanted to point out was there was a report this week, uh, global deep water liquid production offshore is set to jump by 700,000 barrels per day from 2008 to reach a record high of 10.3 million barrels in 2019. So we talk about liquids that can, that that's, that's not just oil, that could be condensates and, uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say is, though, we are starting to see the recovery in offshore oil. Um, it's taking longer than I thought, but uh, it is happening. And after the disastrous fourth quarter for oil prices in 2018, like I said earlier, we've seen a jump of 18% in one month. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. I thought this was an interesting tidbit of information I wanted to point out had some inquiries about this obviously what happens is is you see something pop up in the news we've had some recent you know higher gold prices so you know you start seeing some news articles and what I found this one was interesting was you know world central banks gold buying hits its highest level in half a century it is the second highest uh, purchase of gold by central banks since 1967 which is 51 years ago I find this curious because I thought gold was a barbarous relic and it was outdated. I thought Bitcoin was the future. Why, why are central banks buying gold at record amounts if everything's hunky-dory with paper currencies? I mean, we've talked about this before. I'm not going to get into it. I view gold as insurance against rogue governments. And my knowledge of history and economics, as Ray Dalio says. So I'm not sure where gold prices are going, but I thought this was an interesting tidbit. Um, I do think... All commodities are going to move higher, specifically because of the world central banks now. We're seeing a slowdown in economies. People are getting worried, and we're going to, I think, be moving more back towards a reflation cycle. Um, it appears that uh, Fed Chairman Powell has backed down from raising rates and has even talked about now um, curtailing the quantitative tightening regime that was in place. So... Um, I think gold's sniffing that out. It's sniffing out a reflation. And uh, if, in fact, the economy does roll over and the Fed Federal Reserve is required to lower rates and shift from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing, um, I think gold would soar in that environment. So I think gold may be sniffing that out. Of course, we're covered in the actionable intelligence portfolio, the newsletter, we have uh, positions on to take advantage of that. Irregardless of what happens in the gold or precious metal markets, we are positioned in a company that uh, will do well for us in any type of precious metal environment. Obviously, higher precious metals would be better. Uh, the final point is they had the uh, Vancouver Resource Conference recently in the last couple weeks. Uh, Mike Alkin, who is the uh, proprietor or one of the directors of Sachem Cove um, Partners, which is a uranium-focused fund, and also the uh, writes a newsletter and is a big uranium bull uh, featured before. Most of you guys should know who he is. Had a very um, decent, I uh, thought, uh, pretty good, well-received um, presentation at the resource conference. It's I'll put a link to it in the vid in the um, in the notes. I think at the end of his uh, com at the end of his remarks, he made uh, the following comments, that, uh, referencing the uh, asymmetry in uranium. He said, "I'm doubling down. The risk reward is ridiculous." So um, 
I'll put a link to that, link to all these articles. I really suggest you listen to the Dr. David McKay um, TED Talk, especially if you have any wanting to know about energy return on energy invested and where we're really going to go um, in the future with energy because people don't understand the concepts. First of all, they don't understand how big the numbers are as it regards to how much energy we're consuming. They don't understand how it's delivered. They don't understand the history of it. Um, there's an excellent comments commentary in the recent fourth quarter uh, re- commentary of uh, Goring and Rosenzweig's uh, resource report where they talk about this and they talk about, you know, electric vehicle adoption. It's not going to be as great as people think. And they kind of make it the analogy with the Concorde, which was flying in the 70s. You know, it was mostly rock stars, politicians, very wealthy people that used the Concorde. You know, it could fly from New York to London in like, I don't know, three hours or something like that but it consumed like 850 liters per person of fuel when a conventional 747 would take, you know, six or eight hours to get there and was 250 liters. So, you know, these things actually do matter. Um, It seems like a lot of people that are buying electric vehicles from Tesla, for example, or these new ones that are coming out from Porsche and Audi, they're very expensive vehicles. They're 70, 80, 90, $100,000 vehicles. The average person can't afford this. The yellow vest in France that's protesting higher diesel costs can't afford these. The emerging classes in India, you know, in Myanmar and Bangladesh, they can't afford a $70,000 or $80,000 Tesla. So I think uh, some, of this th- some of this needs to be tempered. I think it's a lot of science fiction. And a lot of people, you know, they want to feel good about it, and I get that. But uh, I don't think that the uh, death of oil is uh, quite... Uh, here right now. I mean, I think over time we move into a more electrified EVs and all that, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than people think. Uh, Speaking of oil, like I said um, earlier, you know, oil rallied the most of any January on record. You can see the chart there. You know, we kind of knew that was going to happen. We have talked in the past of why oil dropped like it did precipitously in the fourth quarter. It's very possible it could, you know, come down again and test that low. I'm not a technical analysis uh, analyst. All I know is that the recent decline is not fundamental in nature. Uh, Saudis and Russians, people are responding. So I suspect that we will uh, be seeing higher oil prices as we go forward. And I think that the oil stocks and oil service stocks re- represent tremendous um, opportunity here because their valuations have just been crushed. We own many oil-related and oil service stocks in the actionable intelligence portfolio. They have not done well because the price of oil and the sentiment towards these stocks is, is terrible. I think that's going to change over the next couple years. I think we are in bull market in oil and resources in general. And these are some of the reasons why I think specific to oil Uh, why we're going higher. Um, Sediment uh, towards oil and oil stocks is extremely bearish. There's irrational valuations in some of these oil stocks. They're selling at, you know, I gave the example, I think a couple weeks ago, where a company, a blue chip company like Schlumberger in the oil services patch is selling at like generational lows. I mean, that's basically saying oil's going away. If you look at the offshore drillers, they're selling at prices that indicate that they're going to go bankrupt and they're going to go away. And that's just not the case. Another reason why I think uh, oil and oil stocks are going higher is that non-OPEC oil supply, which is 60% of oil supply, is set to disappoint going forward due to chronic underinvestment. And that underinvestment is because of this price volatility we've had that doesn't allow for people to make long-term plans and I also think that it comes down to some misplaced reliance on shale along with uh, erroneous peak demand arguments like we've talked about vis-a-vis the adoption of electric vehicles and some of these other things. You know, you can talk about the adoption of electric vehicles all you want, but they're priced out of most people's um, what they can afford. And it goes back to what I said before. Um, the reason we use oil is because it's cheap, plentiful, and it's very energy dense. So. There still is no electric jetliners or electric, you know, 
container ships or electric locomotives. You know, most of this stuff is f diesel fuel, jet fuel. Jet airliner traffic is growing, hum you know, hugely in Asia. It's taking off. So, like I said, petrochemicals, um, all these other things that oil is used for, I think people ignore and just focus on automobiles. And that's not the end-all, be-all. Um, the Saudis have said before, and they continue to say that they need a higher oil price. They are attempting to do a shift away from oil industry. It's costing them about $500 billion. They need at least $75 to $80 a barrel oil Brent price to do what they need to do. Um, so you can expect that they will cut production. They will steer OPEC to a view that lowering production and raising prices to the level they need to see is in everybody's advantage. And as of now, the Russians are playing along. Uh, once oil prices get higher and it starts crimping the economy, which it will here in the U.S., you'll see the president start tweeting again, and this time he won't, the Saudis will not, uh, I believe, uh, acquiesce to his request to increase production after they were double-clutched last year on the Iran sanctions. Um, the IEA, which is the International Energy uh, Administration Agency, uh, has consistently underestimated demand growth. 2019 demand growth is projected to be over 1 million barrels per day increase. That should put us well over 100 million barrels a day of demand. If that continues to increase and probably will keep increasing every year for at least the next decade. Um, you see the recent uh, turmoil in Venezuela. We're not sure what's going to happen there. I had another question came in from a reader. You know, what would happen if uh, the government turns over? Wouldn't that flood the... No. It's going to take a generation to fix the problems. It'll take decades to fix Venezuela's problems. The place is almost prehistoric. There's been no investment for years. There's nobody there pe that you know works in the industry. Yes, you can make gains, but who's going to rush in there and put billions of dollars in there into the you know e even if you get rid of Maduro? You know, people don't seem to understand something. The opposition is not like you know super. Milton Friedman capitalists. They're just socialists light. They're socialists also. So the whole place is infested with this ideology, even the opposition. They just want to do it differently than he did. They don't want to be, you know, stealing like he, him and his cronies are stealing. They're still socialists. So I don't think that there's going to be this huge rush of, you know, investment to come back into Venezuela to repair all of the neglect and damage that's taken place from lack of investment over the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so. I think that's a non-event. I do think Venezuela is going to be a tremendous opportunity at some point because at some point, even the wheels will completely fall off the place and there will be no choice but to abandon this nonsense of socialism. I mean, we've seen this happen over and over around the world. I mean, it gets so bad that you have to reverse course. You have to um, change your policies to get capital in, to get expertise in. We've seen it happen. I can name the country's laundry list. So... Uh, I think it will be an opportunity there. I'm lo actually looking at a couple companies, uh, and but that's that's down the down the line. We have to see how things shake out. But it's not a it's not an issue, you know. If 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 the government changed tomorrow, and Maduro was out and this new guy was in, he, like I said, they're, they're, it's not like you know they're they're going to implement all these reforms and everything's going to you know magically get fixed. It will take years, and years and years to fix what the damage that's been done there. So, you know, uh, just one more thing on Venezuela. It's actually conceivable that oil production could go to zero there. It could completely collapse where there's no oil production, even for domestic oil uh, uh, energy use. So that would be like worst case, but it is conceivable that could happen. Um, I think another thing is, you know, I mentioned earlier in the discussion the uh, Powell Fed becoming less hawkish. Uh, you know, saying they're going to hold off on rate increases and also consider the unwinding of the balance sheet, that is not positive for the U.S. dollar. And a lower dollar is good for commodities and oil. So it may be that we are starting to get the wind back in our sails in some of these um, commodity stocks, resource stocks. So these things are cyclical. Um, that's one part of it. But uh, uh, that would be very bullish if the dollar were to move lower.
So that's it for this week, guys. I um, want to remind you about the Actionable Intelligence newsletter. Uh, encourage you to take a look at it. I uh, want to tell you that if you're apprehensive, you can go to my Patreon site, and if you contribute $5, uh, on a reoccurring basis, I will send you the most current stock pick from the Actionable Intelligence. That way you can get a flavor for the writing that we do and some of the ideas or how we get our ideas. So um, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week.